So, Joe, it's September. Kids are back in school, right? We're starting to maybe start. Thank God they're back in school. <laughs> <laughs> right? But I got to tell you, the worst part of the whole back to school is I have a really hard time trying to figure out what to pack in my kids' lunch. My poor kids get a turkey sandwich every day, like a plain turkey sandwich. I don't know. Like when I get a turkey sandwich, I at least want some mayo, maybe a tomato you know, something, I want to toast the bread, sourdough, give me something. But they're like, nope, uh, plain white bunny bread and Oscar Mayer turkey slices. Not smoked turkey, not mesquite smoked or honey smoked, just mm. plain turkey. Full of that process. And goodness. I'm like, gosh, lunch really has gotten the shaft in, in my mind the last last generation. Oh my God. Right. Right. You plan out breakfast, right? We have delicious things like brunch. Mm, or we've got biscuits those, and gravy. Right. Like mm. there's so many amazing things at breakfast. Mm -hmm. And then we always plan out dinner, right? Dinner's this grand festival of food, right? <laughs> <laughs> you just call it a grand festival it of is. food? I mean, I, I'm just picturing the big, huge table with a huge roast in the middle, mm. like a Norman Rockwell picture, right? And dessert. Overall, right? We always have dessert. We're passing the platter. Now, is that every dinner? Probably yeah. not. Lunch but never gets dessert. Lunch no, never gets an appetizer. No. Lunch is that quick grab-and-go uh, maybe a granola bar because I don't have enough time to think about how to nourish my body right now, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's so much to do in the day. So with that, we decided to talk about lunch. And what in the St. Louis region is good for lunch, specifically sandwiches? Yes. Can't go wrong with a sandwich. You can't go wrong. And you know what? When you think about it, when we sat down and talked about this podcast and, and this episode and what we wanted to talk about, the list got very, very long. Here, looking down at my piece of paper, you know, Lydia said, well, what, what sandwiches and what sandwich shops did you want to mention? And I was like, oh, I'm going to mention this one and this one and this one and this one. Oh, and this one and this one and this one and and that one and that one and this one and that one. And now I've got a list of like 35 different sandwiches across the St. Louis region that I want to talk about, uh, which is actually kind of exciting when you think about it, of all the different options that a sandwich gives you. You know, there's a lot of different things that you can that you can sandwich between two slices of bread. There it is. Well, I'm excited to dive that into it. sounded very, very, uh, what's the <laughs> word I'm looking for? Very. Uh, there is, Joe. Can't think of the word I'm looking for. Philosophical. Yeah. There you go. That's the word I'm go. looking for. Life summed up in a, a sandwich. Layers between bread. That's the title for this episode. <laughs> what can you fit between two pieces of bread? There you go. Well, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna talk about lunch, but I think that before we start diving into the modern day lunch and our choices that we have, I think it's important to really understand how we got here because the landscape of lunch was very different. Even more, when you think about our grandparents, their landscape for lunch was very different. And how here we are in this modern age, and lunch is sort of that forgotten meal. Absolutely. I mean, gone are the days, really, of you get an hour for lunch. Nobody takes an hour lunch break anymore. It's, I'm going to take a 20-minute run downstairs and put something in the microwave between my Zoom calls. And that's about all the respect lunch gets these days, unfortunately. Which is very sad because the purpose of lunch or the goal behind lunch is to refuel yourself, right? Mm -hmm. when, we, when we break down what food is, at the end of the day, food is fuel for our body to be able to process and think properly or to give us the energy to, to handle, um, you know, our tasks for the day. And so really... Lunch has been, and it still is in some countries of the world, the largest meal that people consume, right? Um, just for example, if you go to France, France, they have probably about an hour, hour and a half. It is their biggest meal of their day. They really take their time to enjoy themselves. They course themselves out. Granted, they're not having dinner until 8 or 9 o'clock at night, <laughs> but at the end of the day, they see the purpose of how good lunch can be for us, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, when we start kind of tinkering through history of how things sort of came to be what they are, the Industrial Revolution really transformed lunch and lunch breaks. And it's funny, have you ever heard the term that lunch is referred to as dinner and dinner is referred to as supper? You know, I have. Yes. I forgot what book I read that threw me <laughs> off because they were like, oh, we're going to have this for dinner and this for supper. And I was like, it immediately made me think of Lord of the Rings. And I was like, what about second breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> what about third snack? <laughs> 
Well, that term comes that lunch really wasn't a word for a, an actual meal. Lunch really was a snack between breakfast and dinner. Um, and it's funny because a lot of my um, relatives that are farmers still refer to dinner as their lunch time, right? Their middle of the day meal because supper was later. Lunch started to get transformed during the Industrial Revolution between 12 to 2 when people started to go and file into the workplace and needed to have that moment to rest. Um, but that also created a wonderful thing in the food scene because it was the start of street food, right? It was the start of hot dog carts. It was the start of pretzels. It was. We're going to circle back to hot dogs in a minute, <laughs> just so you know, because I have a question about hot dogs. I so. think it's I think it's important. But all of those quick grab and go foods um, happened. But then things changed. Dun 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 dun. Now I'm going to ask you. Do you know what came to life in the 1930s that changed the lunch scene? Betty White is older than this. Bologna. Uh, no, that's been around longer. Oh. Uh, ooh, sliced bread. You are so correct. That is right, folks. Betty White is older than sliced bread. Sliced bread is that. only 91 years old. So, you know, if grandma's still around, you can ask her what life was like before sliced bread. That's crazy. It's crazy to think that. <laughs> But that transformed um, having consistent um, cuts of bread to be able to make sandwiches. Um, peanut butter was a huge marketing ploy um, for sandwiches that came out. Same thing with that leftover uh, meat. So we had uh, meatloaf sandwiches, which really aren't a thing very much anymore. <laughs> we had bologna sandwiches. Um, and a little fun fact Right, we know the World Fair of St. Louis. We're going to talk about the St. Louis World Fair because so many food inventions came out of the St. Louis World Fair. Can you name any? Uh, uh, ice cream cones. Okay. Any more? Um, hot dog buns. Okay. I think that's one. Maybe I'm wrong. Any more? <laughs> Lydia's looking on her computer to fact check me really fast. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, oh, let's I feel sure like there's factual. one. I think there's something else. Um, you are right about the hot dog buns. Yes. Ice cream cone. Well, it really was the hot dog. Oh. Yeah, the hot dog. There's some debate Which, about Which, okay, it. let's ask you. Is, is the hot dog a sandwich? Well. We're talking about sandwiches today. Is a hot dog a sandwich? We can address it later, but let's put that in let's your put mind. Let's put it in there. Let's put it in there now. Put a pin in we'll it. circle back. Put a pin in it. We'll circle back okay. to that because inquiring minds want to know. Yes. Hot dog a sandwich. Yes or no. Comment below. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say yes because we'll it's it's meat shoved we'll between to... two two slices of bread. Then it is a taco a sandwich. I mean, that's a meat. It could be. It's not an answer, Lydia. I don't know. All right, <laughs> all right. Let's keep going. Okay, so World Fair, St. Louis okay. World Fair. Check. Peanut butter okay. actually made its debut. Now I know there's a lot of controversy about where peanut butter started and where it really came from, but commercially, that's mm -hmm. when it came out. Mm -hmm. Now that was back in 1904. Okay. But it wasn't shel self shelf. Let's say that five times fast. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't shelf stable, so they weren't able to really put it out in the market well, now, in full bloom. If that happened in 1904, that's a good 27 years before sliced bread. Exactly. Why did they make peanut butter if there was not to put it on sliced bread? It was actually created to help um, individuals that had bad teeth or no teeth to be able to get a protein source. So they, they took nuts and they pureed them down huh. and they were able to offer a good protein source to individuals that couldn't chew meat. Oh, yeah. well, there you go, St. Louis trivia folks. Yes. Next trivia night you go to, that may pop up. Yes, there you go. And just in case you needed to know, it was the boil, or wait, I want to make sure. Yeah, Bailey. Uh, George Bailey was the gentleman that was responsible for it. It came out of St. Louis. Huh. Yeah. All right. Quick question. Yeah. On your peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, are you a grape jelly or a strawberry jelly person? Oh, that's a tough question. Yeah. I'm, I'm a banana person with my peanut butter. Okay, Elvis. I, I'm, right. I'm okay with that. <laughs> I'm okay with that. That's a good, it's an okay answer. Um, are you a fluffer nutter person? Like, I am. Anything marshmallow, I'm a sucker I for. I know you are. That's why I yeah, teed that I one up for you. Um, my wife will actually do peanut butter and pickle sandwiches. Oh, that sounds delicious. No, it doesn't. It I think it sounds horrible. <laughs> and I want sympathy that I married somebody Sorry. that makes peanut butter and, and pickle sandwiches. Well, you um, have a hatred for pickles. So I, I have think a hatred for pickles and anyways. pumpkin spice. Yes. Um, 
but I, yes, I think that's disgusting. Um, I love my wife. I think that's gross. Um, so there's many options beyond just jelly for peanut butter. And there I think is. that's overlooked sometimes. It is. But you know what the sad thing is, is that peanut butter and jelly sandwiches are now evolving because so many kids don't have that option available to them. Peanut butter is is being taken out of homes because it's not an option for people to bring into school. A lot mm-hmm. of schools are nut-free zones mm-hmm. due to allergies. So there is um, sun butter as the alternative, which sun butter is sunflower seeds that have essentially been pureed into butter form. Um, I don't think it is as um, enthusiastically enjoyed as yeah, peanut butter not is. quite as satisfying yes. as a big old dub of crunchy yes. peanut butter. So you think about our kids that are coming up through school. They don't have the joy of training a peanut butter and jelly sandwich as much as you and I did. Um, but I will tell you, they will have the joy of eating a Lunchable because that's readily available. <laughs> you know what, though? It's okay because I'm sure when in 1904 at the World's Fair, when the first peanut butters came out, they were probably not the yummy, delicious, skippy peanut butter that we eat today. Probably not. So sun butters may be in their infancy, and maybe when our kids have kids, they'll talk about how they had the first sun butters, and now their kids are eating the most delicious variety of sun butters, and there's multiple versions, and they're and they're having podcasts where they're talking about sun butter and jelly sandwiches as opposed to peanut butter and, and jelly sandwiches. Their Who knows? Kids can ask us what it was like to live in a peanut butter age. I know a pe- the age of peanut butter. <laughs> We may be millennial, older millennials, but we are the age of peanut butter. There you go. There you go. Yum. Well, let's talk about lunch meat. We brought up Lunchables, yes. which now I will say that we are a more matured age than what we were in our youth in the school cafeteria, that we have now transformed Lunchables to charcuterie boards, right? I, I love seeing that <laughs> meme. It's so, when I saw that, it was so true to be like, darn it, that's right. We I all know. had our little trays of perfectly round turkey, perfectly square cheddar cheese, some crackers, and maybe a Nestle Crunch Bar in our little Lunchable. And now, and Lydia knows this because I've seen some Lydia Gwyn charcuterie platters. Um, you know, now we just we we cover all different cuts of meats and we make meat flowers out of them and we have piles of nuts and and dried fruits and it's beautiful and it's delicious and we love it and it all goes back to that we were fed lunchables as children. We knew how to deconstruct before deconstructing was a thing. I mean, memes <laughs> memes memes are always rooted in some truth, and that one is for real. But when we did a uh, Chew Crew poll to see really what the favorite modern lunch meat is, can you, do you have any guess what it was? It was not bologna, I'll tell you that. <laughs> nope, nope. It was actually turkey, which isn't surprising. Turkey surprising. has become a very healthy alternative compared to what lunch meat used to be. It's kind of be. a utilitarian lunch meat. Yes. You know, it's a little healthier than ham. It pairs well with lettuce and tomato. You can... You can jazz it up with some bacon. You can California it up with some avocado. You can, it goes on wheat. It goes on white. It goes in a wrap. I mean, turkey, you can make it into turkey bacon. I mean, like turkey really is quite the um, versatile lunch meat. Yes, yes. And sadly, bologna, you keep bringing it up. We need to talk about bologna. You know, let's talk a lot. I mean, my bologna has a first name. It's O-S-C-A-R, um, and nobody buys it anymore. Um, I remember growing up as a kid, my dad liked to make fried bologna sandwiches. I occasionally would eat one. I don't think I've bought bologna in 20 years. Um, but I do think that that bologna is making a comeback. Yes. And I'm going to point you to an example from Grace Meat and Three, yes. uh, the, the popular fried chicken southern food restaurant here in St. Louis. Grace Meat and Three has a fried bologna sandwich where they pair fried bologna with pimento cheese, a duck egg, and a mustard sauce that really doesn't do it justice. They need to just give it a new name and not call it fried bologna. Because I think immediately when people think fried bologna, they think a round piece of bologna pulled out of a plastic wrap container and slung into a grill and put on a piece of white bread with some yellow right. mustard and that's it. And that is not what is happening in the modern bologna sandwich making arena in St. Louis. Um, and I think it deserves a try if it's been a while since you have had bologna. Yeah. Well, I think we need to reconstruct our thought process of what bologna is, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it is not this processed synthetic meat. It is actually called bologna because it's from Bologna, Italy, 
It is a sausage that is made there. Um, but sadly, over the course of time, we've referred to it as the mystery meat, very similar to Spam. Spam is delicious. Delicious. It is amazing. <laughs> spam and eggs and rice. Such oh, yeah. A good I was going to say it makes a great fried rice. Yes. So, you know, there's there's a lot of benefit to it. But bologna and Spam were meats that came through during a hard time in our American history as a good alternative. Mm -hmm. um, so when we look at sandwich, right, a sandwich is, is something quick. It's easy. It, we could throw it in our hands and eat it very quickly. Um, and it provides a lot of our great nutrients and fuel that we need based off what you put in it. Mm -hmm. Another forgotten lunch meat. This one I think is going to stay forgotten for a while was Braunschweiger. I throw that out there just because it, it sends shivers down my spine to mention the word Braunschweiger. Um, my grandmother would make brown Schweiger sandwiches when she stayed with us over the summer. Um, that was we were always like, "Oh, what's for lunch today, Grandma?" When she would babysit us, and she'd say, "I'm making brown Schweiger sandwiches. Do you want one?" And it was always met with an emphatic no from the grandkids. Um, it, 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 it's disgusting. A brown Schweiger should stay in the dustbin of forgotten lunch meats. Uh, I'm okay with bologna coming back out if it's treated well, like grace meat and three. Um, another really good example of someone that's pulled out a lunch meat that may be forgotten sometimes is Nomad in Dogtown. They have a smoked pastrami sandwich. Mm. I think pastrami um, it has, was not quite as relegated as bologna was. Um, there was still a niche market there for, for pastrami. Nomad is bringing pastrami back, yes. really giving it a fantastic treatment for a sandwich. So if you're looking for something yummy, that one is delicious as well. It's kind of like a revenge of the forgotten lunch meats. You yeah, know, as people are kind of going back and saying, let's take turkey and make really great club sandwiches. Let's take bologna and up it with some really great ingredients and treat it well and show you what you can do with it. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see that happening at some local St. Louis restaurants. For sure, for sure. Now, you being a St. Louisian through and through, through, and through, you have had probably a little bit more exposure to some of the really great traditional St. Louis with sandwiches here what would you say are probably your top three go-to sandwiches oh Lydia as I explained at the beginning I've got a list of 30 here in front <laughs> of me and you're asking me to nail it down to three. Oh my goodness okay um hmm. oh, I'm sorry I'm thinking everybody so I'm gonna start off number one with Adriana's on the hill um, Adriana's is a sandwich shop located on Shaw down in the hill. Um, they always have a line out the door. Um, you know, you, they have a variety of Italian sandwiches. They serve them on really nice kind of seeded bread. Um, they have, um, like warm roast beef and cheese. They have, my favorite is this Sicilian tzatzitza sandwich, which is, um, some sliced tzatzitza with some Provel cheese and Italian dressing mm -hmm. on really good bread and toast with a side salad. They have a nice Italian salad. Um, you know, the classic Italian salad with a little bit of Provel, Italian dressing, pimentos, all that kind of stuff. Oh, it's so good. Really, really fantastic stuff. Everybody can find something. If you like an Italian sandwich, Adriana's has some good stuff for you. Sticking with the hill, you have to mention Joya's. Um, Joya's is known famous for their hot salami sandwich. They make their own hot salami. They slice it real thick, put it on a sandwich. Um, they add in cheese. You can get jardinera on it. They have the spicy daggett is another one of their sandwiches. Really, really fantastic Italian deli to get what is one of the more famous Italian sandwiches in St. Louis. My third one. I'm going to go with the gramophone, actually, um, in oh, the Grove. Yeah. I actually just had one last week from there. I had the Fight Club. Roast beef, mushrooms, kind of a horseradish cream sauce on it, a tomato, really nice big sandwich, really well done. Um, I like a sandwich that has a lot of flavor components in it mm -hmm. um, that is a full meal within two slices of bread. And I like a sandwich that doesn't overlook the bread as an ingredient. If you've got boring bread, you're going to have a boring sandwich, in my opinion. No matter how good the ingredients are, nothing can outshine bad bread. Um, so you've got to have good bread. You've got to treat it well. It's got to be fresh. It's probably got to be toasted in some way to give it some good texture, some crisp on the outside. It's got to be soft in the right areas. Um, so those, if I had to give three off the top of my head, um, you know, 
if you'd asked me this question a year and a half ago or before the pandemic, I would have said Nora's in Dogtown. They have since closed, but I have to pour one out to Nora's in Dogtown. They had my all-time favorite sandwich in St. Louis, which was called the Layton, that had an herb cream cheese. Um, you had portobello mushrooms on it. It had house-smoked roast beef. Um, you could dip it in au jus. It was a phenomenal, phenomenal sandwich from a phenomenal sandwich shop in Dogtown. They closed in the pandemic. They haven't come back. That net location is now where Alibi Cookies is, which is also good. Um, so yay, Alibi Cookies for being there. But I do miss Nora's in Dogtown. So. Sorry to hear about that. I'm sorry I never get to experience that. It sounds amazing. I know. But really. I will go ahead and agree with you on the gramophone. I have been there multiple times for their sandwiches, and no two sandwiches have disappointed me. Like mm. I have, I, you just get this huge foil wrap sandwich, and you know it's just total artistic yeah. delicious. And I can't, you can't just go with just three. And that's yeah. the tough part in this. There's like, there's banh mi's from places. There's, right. yeah. Joe, our listeners mom's, do have Mom's Deli go. on Jameson. You've got Le Grand's. You've got, ha, ah, there's so many options. I know. Well, for, for me, the Annex is one that I love to go to because. And where's that? That is in Webster Grove. Oh, that's right. It's right. right next to Frisco. It's across the street from the Balkan Treat Box. It's right there on Big Ben, um, right off the 44 exit. Oh, yeah, they have one of the great BLTs. They do, mm. the really thick cut BLTs. That's right up in there. Their sandwich menu is so diverse. They have an Italian beef, mm -hmm. right? They have a Cubano. They have a buy me sandwich on there, mm -hmm. um, a Southwest turkey. Um, they've got a ham and jam sandwich, right? Mm -hmm. Which sounds So, like fun. a Monte Cristo kind of, a, like a play off of Monte Cristo? Oh, yes, but not deep fried. So, okay. it's a little bit healthier for you. Close um, and then they just have a nice variety. And what they put on there is stuff that they have made in house. So, it's, they have a tomato fennel jam that they smear all over their BLT sandwich mm -hmm. that just really yep. elevates it from that other BLT. Yep. Um, the other one that I have to go to is Vitali's. So, we're going to call out another hill. But Vitaly's one that I go to is in Glendale, and um, I'm not gonna lie. When I get the the meatball sandwich there, it is phenomenal. It's just their house home family recipe of their marinara sauce, big huge meatballs. Um, I have to eat it with no one else around me because it gets a little intimate. Like I've got the napkin <laughs> shoved down my shirt. I've got any the good sauce Italian sandwich should be an intimate experience, <laughs> right? Like there is no sharing. There is do not look at me. I get that look in my eye where it's just me and the sandwich just divulging. Um, and then lastly, we can't talk about sandwiches without talking about the Union Loafer, right? You talked about good mm. bread makes an amazing sandwich. The Union Loafer I've, has I've got never it. been, but I know people oh, that love Union Loafers. What do you get at Union Loafers? So Union Loafer is is um, part bakery, part um, restaurant. So there, I'm a sucker for anything beets. I get their smoked beet Reuben. So Wait, it's a smoked beet Reuben. Yes. So you can't not go there without getting this because it's a play on it's – it's a wonderful vegetarian option, um, but it's a wonderful option for anyone that wants to explore something unique. So it's pickled smoked beets, and then, of course, you have the other components that you would with a Reuben. You've got the sauerkraut. You've got the Thousand Island dressing. And then it's sandwiched between their signature ciabatta bread. Mm. And you just you – just, you know – another little intimate sandwich that you're gonna just enjoy with each other so but so I, much intimacy between two slices of bread i know right that sounds like a therapy session right there <laughs> <laughs> but you know here we go back to the same question what makes a sandwich right does it have to be meat that goes in between no does it have to be bread that you put on the outside yes i think so you think so i think so so what do you think for, you know, people that maybe can't enjoy a nice loaf of bread? Well, and that's what a good is question. Is Like for our, our gluten-free friends out there yeah. or gluten-sensitive, what do you do for lunch? Everyone else is grabbing sandwiches. What do you grab? Yeah, I'm, I, I will speak as someone who has tried to cut bread out of my life, sadly. Uh, there are a so few, few small moments. They did, you know, come back. But there are wonderful wraps, like lettuce wraps are a great one. There's wonderful gluten-free options for tortilla options or wraps. So you, you could still enjoy all of that. Aldi's makes a, uh, it's not local chain, obviously, but Aldi's has an egg wrap you can buy that they have on the regular Ooh. that you can make a wrap out of. It's a, a, an egg. Nice. The, um, or, or egg and cauliflower, too. And they're actually oh, not bad. That sounds delicious. Yeah. Now, I will say a shout-out if you're not a meat person. 
we're going to have to call out the STL Bico. Not Redco. Panera. Not Panera. No, it's not Panera. We're in St. Louis, folks. STL Bico. Um, Get your bagel sliced bread style exactly. and call it Redco. <laughs> so they have the best Mediterranean sandwich. If you've never had it before, it is just everything you could ever want in a vegetable sandwich. So you've got the crispy cucumbers. You have roasted tomatoes on it. You've got feta cheese. It's on their sun-dried tomato bread. Mm. Um, and it has this spicy hummus that they also put on there as well. It's perfect. It's delicious. There's yeah. an onion on there. It's. I would say if you're looking for a veg- vegetable option or without meat, that would be a good one to go to. Now, if you're also a gluten-free person um, or gluten-sensitive person, I'm a big fan of Crazy Bowls and Wraps. Yes. Um, another local company um, that has some really great bowls and wraps. Um, uh, specifically the bowls, though, that you can get with quinoa or uh, rice. They've got all sorts of really yummy stuff. Their poke bowl is really amazing as a lunch option. Easy to grab and run through. There's quite a few of them throughout the St. Louis region that you can go to. Big fan of the poke bowl. Big fan of their... Um, Thai chicken, their, their peanut sauce, really, really yummy. Um, so there's some options out there um, for those of you that may be looking for an easy, quick lunch option. But give lunch its due. Yes. Give Make it, sure give you give it lunch its, its due. So a real quick question for you. What goes with your sandwich or your lunch option? What's your side? Is I mean, chips are always an option. Yes. What kind of chip do you like? Oh, I am hands down the voodoo chips really yeah zappos voodoo chips are my Mm. go-to i like it so yeah i like a good red hot riplet i mean let's go local they're they're delicious they're tasty they're ubiquitous with st louis a really good barbecue chip though a really really good crunchy crispy kettle cooked barbecue chip if you got a good sandwich with a nice bread you know a good barbecue chip really just seals the deal for me now, do you put the chips in the sandwich? That no. is a question. No. I understand why people might, and there may be a sandwich that needs the texture, but absolutely not. I got to tell you, if you do it with salt and vinegar chips, change game changer. I don't like salt and vinegar chips. Oh, my God. Game changer. I don't like That's pickles, other... so I don't like vinegar. Don't no. do it. All right. All nope. right. Nope. So you're the oil to every conversation, right? I, <laughs> <laughs> I am the thicker of the two, so <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> Uh, what's um well so we've got our sandwiches we've got our chips but i think the other big thing with lunch is give yourself time to enjoy it right we tend to be so quick at lunch that we tend to not really appreciate the food that we're eating and Mm -hmm. enjoying and there Mm -hmm. as you can tell by our list there's plenty of amazing places there are plenty and we encourage you guys if you have a place in st louis where you live near your work away from your work with your family away from your family where you like to get lunch share it with us go on chew in the loo give us a picture give us a post tell us what your favorite lunch option is in the st louis region because we're always on the lookout for new places to try obviously we have our places that we like to go to but our job is to find the new places and explore them and try them and we want you guys to come along on that journey again with us and to share with each other that is i think the best gift we can give each other is by telling where our little gems of the neighborhood are so the next time you're sitting there either with someone or by yourself at lunch and enjoying a really kick butt sandwich make sure you share it with us I love it. Well, that is all that we have today, but make sure that you tune in for our next podcast where we talk about apples. Oh, how about them apples? How about them apples? What is in season? You have no idea how much St. Louis apple history and places to do and things there are. So I don't know if that was proper grammar. (laughs) Probably not. (laughs) How about them apples is not proper grammar either, but we're going to say it. There you go. Well, thanks for tuning in with us, and we look forward to having you join us next time. Bye, y'all. Your hosts for the Chew in the Lou podcast are Lydia Gwynn and Joe Prosperi and produced by Veronica Moheski. This is a production of 9PBS in St. Louis.